Hello everybody, my name is Stephen Freeland. I'm a professor of international law at Western Sydney University. I'm speaking to you actually from Sydney where it is very, very hot at the moment. Um, I am sincerely uh, regret the fact that I can't be with you for the conference at Yale, but uh, I wish you well. I know that my colleagues on this panel will have some very interesting things to say, and they've asked me for a few minutes to talk about uh, the potential for international criminal law to play an important part in the post-conflict peace-building functions. Um, particularly in relation to environmental destruction during the warfare. Um, as you're all aware, we have more and more conflicts in the world. We have a greater propensity in terms of our weapons technology for environmental destruction. The strategy of warfare is changing so that uh, increasingly the environment is now utilised as a target or a victim as part of military strategies. All of this at a time when our consciousness about the environment is greater and greater for a whole range of reasons. And so there's a mismatch in terms of the way deliberate destruction of the environment as a strategy of war is regulated, um, as opposed to our increasing sense of the significance and importance of maintaining environmental integrity as much as possible. And that's really what I'd like to talk about very briefly. My message is simple in this short amount of space, time that I have to speak. That is that um, whilst, of course, it's not a panacea in terms of the regulation of all forms of environmental destruction, including deliberate environmental destruction, International criminal law can play an important role in certain circumstances to regulate and sanction and give rise to accountability for actions during warfare. That has a number of effects. Clearly, it informs all of those involved in um, conflict that the environment is important that the environmental effects of the con conduct of warfare need to be taken into account. It acts as potentially a deterrent factor because of the strength of the sanctions that can apply under international criminal law. And indeed, it sends a strong message that it is now unacceptable to target the environment in a significant way. Um, despite the fact that this has happened in the past. All of this is predicated on this truism. Unfortunately, we must have warfare because that is the way of the world. And if we have war, we must have law, including rules that are relevant for the environment. In terms of previous activities involving targeting the environment, we've had many examples in the past of scorched earth tactics. Um, here's a photo of a situation in the northern Norwegian province of Finnmark where the retreating German forces scorched the earth even in an effort to slow down the Russian forces that were following it. As you know, during the Vietnam War, there was a systematic program involving the spraying of herbicides, including Agent Orange, over the foliage in parts of Vietnam, which resulted in significant environmental impact. As you also know, in the first Gulf War, the retreating Iraqi forces set fire to over 800 oil wells in Kuwait, and also poured about 4 million barrels of oil into the waters, targeting the environment. Even more recently, the Saddam regime, in response to what it perceived to be insurrection in southern Iraq from the Madan Arabs, deliberately targeted the environment in the context of this internal armed conflict, converting what was known as the Garden of Eden and an area in which over half a million Madan Arabs depended upon for their livelihood, converting this into hell. So 
What is the legal position in terms of accountability for this? Well, we have a number of international treaty provisions, particularly the use in Bello, which to a certain degree is relevant in terms of environmental destruction, but by and large is unsatisfactory in that almost inevitably any environmental damage is to be balanced against perceived military advantage. And that balance is very much skewed towards accepting reasonable action in the context of military or perceived military advantage. The international environmental treaties really don't deal with the issue of warfare very much at all. And indeed, there are some issues as to whether those environmental agreements would apply during times of armed conflict. Regional and national law, by and large, do not address the issue. There is some very significant jurisprudence from the International Court of Justice, which deals with the importance of the environment and stressing the fact that the environment must be taken into account when conducting armed conflict activities. However, that doesn't give rise to accountability and sanctions for those who actually deliberately target the environment. That role is one that can be taken up by international criminal law. And so it's important to look at the mechanisms of international criminal justice that have been established. And also there have been some jurisprudence within those tribunals that are relevant, although not really specifically directed towards what we need to have in terms of legal regulation. So briefly, because I would like international criminal law to be used as one tool in this area, let's have a quick discussion about what international criminal law is. As most people would be aware, international criminal law is about accountability. Accountability for what we call international crimes. These are crimes that through a series of factors are determined essentially by the international community as those that are totally unacceptable on a global basis in terms of behaviour. They give rise to the need for accountability. That accountability is largely in terms of individual criminal responsibility. So this is not an issue of state responsibility, but an issue rather of individual criminal responsibility. And as you all are aware, in the past two decades, a number of mechanisms of international criminal justice have been established to enforce and implement these rules of international criminal law. One of those mechanisms is, of course, the International Criminal Court, which I'll focus on in a moment, a permanent court that is here to look not only at uh, international crimes that have occurred in the past, but those that potentially could occur in the future. Of course, because we are talking about criminal law, Basic human rights and principles of legality require that any crime designated either in national criminal law or international criminal law is clearly enunciated. And because of the context that I'm talking about, that is international criminal law affecting a whole range of states and those within their jurisdiction, there's also a political element as to whether any such crime is essentially acceptable and therefore to be included in the mandate of the international courts that have been established. So what I've done is I've looked at the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court. That has a number of crimes. The crimes of genocide and crimes against humanity largely are inappropriate for meeting the imperative of addressing environmental destruction. There is an existing war crime that for the first time in international criminal law does talk about environmental destruction and damage. However, through its terms, Article 82B4 essentially means that it's virtually impossible to achieve a prosecution. I therefore believe the following. There is an imperative for a whole range of reasons to appropriately regulate against the intentional destruction of the environment during warfare. 
the existing international law principles outside of international criminal law don't meet this imperative. Nor does national law, which by definition is not designed to address these sorts of issues and in terms of post-conflict peace building for, from environmental destruction issues. So I think international criminal law is an, one appropriate tool to deal with this issue and also of course can contribute to peace building. The existing principles in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court are however flawed in this regard and it's important therefore that that be upgraded given the influential and trend-setting nature of that document. And finally therefore I propose that a sui generis crime which I call crimes against the environment should be incorporated as a further fifth crime within the Rome Statute. Obviously, I've talked about a lot in a very short space of time. Um, I have written a book on this issue and I'd be delighted if you would be interested in looking at that. I've also here included my email details. I'm more than happy to have further discussion. I know that you will have interesting discussions with my fellow panellists and I hope that this brief discussion has also perhaps stimulated some further ideas which we can all work on together. I thank you for your attention. I wish you well for the conference and I send you greetings from very, very hot Sydney. Bye-bye.